ceremony. <laughs> Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim Ali. We'll be moderating tonight. The format of the college consists of the following. First, there is an announcements period. Second, there is a... Our speaker will speak, followed by a question and answer period, where we ask that you ask questions and not give a, give a speech at that time, because you will be able to, to get your remarks and your rebuttal and on a rebuttal period, which is the last part of the thing. Tonight's speaker is uh, Dennis Nelson, and uh, Dennis Nelson is probably one of the best speakers we've had on this topic on our Earth Day. He speaks extensively about solar and wind power. He's part of the Nuclear Energy Information Service. I know he prepares well for his speeches. So let's welcome tonight uh, Dennis Nelson. And a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Happy birthday. Ready, Dick? And thanks for coming. My name is uh, Dennis Nelson. I'm always privileged and honored to be the uh, keynote speaker around Earth Day, uh, which is officially tomorrow. This is all Earth Day weekend. Activities are going on. And the schedule will, uh, the presentation will follow pretty much the format, except I'm adding Endangered Species in the Endangered Species Act. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to you'll say a few uh, introductory remarks. Again, uh, above all, one fool at a time. Be respectful toward each other. And develop, if you don't have them, active listening skills and courtesy. And that's uh, just as much a part of being an advocate and activist as it is being correct on the issue. It's not just what you say, but how you say it and how you come off to people. Yeah. I want to get something out of the way right now in terms of my political orientation. I am progressive and a populist who happens to vote Democrat. I'm a progressive Democrat. We're going to be talking a lot about what the Trump administration is doing wrong and pointing the direction of what things are going to be right. I don't want people to get locked in, though, into an ideological Republican versus Democrat situation. The issues for sin, Republican versus Democrat, liberal versus conservative, ideologies, and also red versus blue. And this is the worldview that I've had uh, developed since uh, the first Earth Day. Another thing, I appreciate your outrage, your disgust, your concern about the things that are happening regarding the wild and wacky world of the Trump uh, White House in Washington, D.C. <laughs> However, when it comes to Earth Day, as the expression goes, I'm pretty much old school, okay? I'm old school. We're going to talk about energy issues, conservation issues, environmental issues. Maybe some other things will come up, some of the things that you may have heard about, some things that are going to be new to you, and that's fine. That's the purpose of the presentation. It's impossible for me to cover all the topics that could be covered. There is an immense amount of material out there, and I pared it down so I can get through the presentation easier. If we were to discuss every single thing the Trump administration is doing wrong on the environment, we'd be here literally all night, and you know they're going to kick us out. <laughs> Yeah. before 9 o'clock. So if there's anything that tickles your fancy, any issues that I haven't discussed, please don't say I forget. I forgot something. Don't. That's going to turn me off because I'm very aware. I do a lot of action alerts. This is just the tip of the iceberg. So if you have something, that, there's a lot of, and I'm deliberately leaving some issues out. And I'm also deliberately maybe doing a one or two liners on other issues because I don't have time for everything. So if you want to go back and discuss anything that I've mentioned or bring up something new, please feel free. Okay, last year was the big dukeru, the big uh, debate between uh, nuclear free versus nuclear thorium. In one corner was me, Dennis Nelson, representing Nuclear Energy Information Service, representing a nuclear free future. Tim Bolger representing the Thorium Energy Alliance, representing a nuclear thorium future. While he announced I was a member of NEIS, and I've been for so many years, this is not an NEIS presentation per se, and it's not included in the write-up, so that because most of the topic, except for one, or really two, don't really deal with nuclear energy topics. I just want to clarify that. The debate went well. Afterwards, a lady came up to me and said, I thought that this presentation tonight was going to be about Earth Day. Now, yeah. I've used Earth Day as a springboard to discuss a variety of issues. 
I've been active since the first one. This is the 48th one I've been involved with. But I got to thinking, maybe it's a good time to get, take a moment to talk about the history and significance of Earth Day. So here we go. The original Earth Day uh, was Wednesday, April 22nd, in 1970. And this is the 48th anniversary of Earth Day. My involvement, this is my official anniversary. There was a pre-Earth Day event, and I'll explain that. I was a sophomore in high school at Thomas Jefferson High School in Council Bluffs, Iowa. We had a pre-Earth Day march, walk, whatever march. We picked up trash, walked uptown to uh, Bayless Park near the library and listened to some speakers. And then I came back home. And this was a really a significant day for me because that was the night that I had my Eagle Scout Court of Honor and got my Eagle Scout Award. Now, just as a brief um, <laughs> side, as a brief footnote, well, I'm not going to go into in detail right now, but there's a book we discussed here at the college called The Merchants of Doubt. And I can get into that in more detail, but there's a quote, there's a notation, there's a book where environmentalists are characterized as watermelons, red on the inside and green on the outside, referring to, you know, we're a bunch of commie pinkos. Well, and the first time I read that, I really wasn't dismayed. I really wasn't shocked. I, nothing really shocks me. I really wasn't disgusted or angry as I was amused saying, boy, the Boy Scouts of America must sure be that left-wing organization because that's how I got involved. Everybody has their own story to tell. And so this is my official anniversary. But the whole weekend is Earth Day weekend. and There's a lot of activities going on, okay? Earth Day was the brainchild of U.S. Senator Gaylord Nelson, a Democrat from Wisconsin, who later went on to become the executive director of a national environmental group called the Wilderness Society. The executive director, I mean the national coordinator of Earth Day, the national coordinator was Dennis Hayes. Different spelling of mine. I'm D-E-N-N-I-S, he's D-E-N-I-S. And he went on to become the executive director of Surrey, the Solar Energy Research Institute, in Golden, Colorado, outside of Denver, in the Carter years, which is now the National Renewable Energy Lab. The activism of the anti-Vietnam War movement and the Civil Rights Movement, uh, both from the 60s, spilled over into the 70s and helped to create Earth Day. There are visible examples of environmental pollution back then. Uh, the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill off the coast of California, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio that literally caught on fire because of it was so contaminated with oil, and Lake Erie was declared biologically dead. Now there are three classic books that I read in high school that helped to influence Earth Day. One from the 1960s was the classic Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, which we've, uh, in fact, I've talked about in one of my previous Earth Day presentations. It was the 50th anniversary commemorating back then the uh, publishing of Silent Spring. I talked about the overuse and misuse of toxic chemical pesticides. The other was The Population Bomb by Dr. Paul Ehrlich, an entomologist and, and, and population biologist from Stanford University, pointing out the uh, the problem of overpopulation, the need to reduce our population size. Uh, Paul Ehrlich became my role model for being a uh, scientist activist, in fact, when I was growing up. The third book is Science and Survival by Barry Commoner. Uh, Dr. Barry Commoner was a plant uh, physiologist and ecologist. Uh, Time Magazine called him the Paul Revere of Ecology. And Science and Survival talked about um, the perils, the problems of misuse of technology, faulty technologies, dangerous technologies. And back then, you know, he referred to nuclear power as a folly, which it still is. Earth Day was the first environmental teach-in, an estimated 20 million of us around the country participated. Earth Day helped to establish an environmental infrastructure, which I'm a product of and participant of all these years. We have environmental laws in the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, U.S. EPA, which of course the Trump administration, Republicans in Congress, and some of the Democrats are attacking. Uh, one of the reasons why um, the Cuyahoga River isn't catching fire anymore and that Lake Erie isn't declared officially biologically dead is because of a landmark law called the Clean Water Act. But we still have problems with the uh, Great Lakes that we'll get into that uh, we, we can discuss. 
environmental classes and programs in schools. I'm a direct product of this. Uh, but the, the last quarter of my junior year in Council Bus, my dad was with the Chicago Northwestern Railroad Real Estate Department, now UP, Union Pacific. We got transferred up to Rosemount, Minnesota, one of the suburbs outside of the Twin Cities, St. Paul and Minneapolis. And uh, the high school was Rosemount Senior High School. And my senior year, I took a semester class, Environmental Action, the first semester, which uh, again, a product of Earth Day. And, uh, and then after I graduated, uh, my dad got transferred back to the office in Omaha, Nebraska, across the Missouri River, and moved back to Council Bluffs. And Roseanne Peterson was a elementary education major at Dana College in Blair, Nebraska, a small uh, liberal arts college. And, and we were going to move back, and she goes, oh, Dennis should come to Dana. We have an environmental studies program. So my proclivities were, were known by my friends and family even back then. So moved back and uh, went to the college and had my bachelor's of science degree. So this is part of the infrastructure. And Northeastern Illinois University, for what it's worth, has a master's degree in environmental studies through its geography program. Again, another part of the infrastructure after Earth Day. Environmental reporters and environmental news beats, a part of the infrastructure. A lot of uh, visitor nature centers are having family-friendly events, I'm sure, this Earth Day weekend. Uh, there are Cook County Forest Preserves I've been to that have these uh, visitor nature centers. I've also been to national parks, national wildlife refuges, and national forests that have these visitor nature centers. Again, another uh, infrastructure uh, after Earth Day. Recycling centers and recycling programs, another part of the infrastructure after Earth Day. Environmental sections in bookstores and libraries. Before borders went under, they had a very excellent environmental section I used to get a, a lot of my stuff at. And Barnes and Noble also has a good uh, environmental section, and part of the infrastructure uh, after Earth Day. Last but not least, we have environmental publishers. One is what is called Island Press. These happen to be two books that I'm reading that I got at the Harold Washington Library Center. Uh, Markets in the Environment, second edition, and Energy Sprawl Solutions, Balancing Global Development and Conservation. These might come in handy tonight, including this one, depending upon what the questions are. This is good reading, but part of the infrastructure after Earth Day. <laughs> Resist the Trump administration's regressive anti-environmental agenda and empower a progressive pro-ecological agenda to make America even greater. And to uh, set the tone, this is a, a, peti uh, a citizen's petition to uh, President Donald Trump. It's from a group called Earth Justice, and it was sent on February 4th of this year. Dear President Trump, no one voted for dirtier air and water in last year's election, but you and others who now hold key cabinet and cabinet level posts in, our, in your administration are claiming a mandate to turn back the clock on vital progress our country has made in building a clean energy infrastructure that will not only create jobs, but protect our nation's climate future. As a concerned citizen and voter, I urge you to advance action on climate disruption placing the health and safety of families ahead of short-term corporate profits. Further, I call on you to uphold common sense measures that will safeguard the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the special places of wildlife we treasure. Now, along with that, they have a special mailing. And we have, a, a, it's on the envelope, our, our rogues list. So we're gonna go through this briefly, okay? We have Donald Trump president. President Trump has called climate change a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese, scrapped the Clean Power Plan, withdrawn the U.S. from the Paris Climate Agreement, gutted the Clean Air Act, and spurred a massive resurgence in, in dirty energy, oil, gas, and coal. The it is nice if the guys who are gentlemen, conducting gentlemen, conversations the, the, the in the back, up here they shut be, up yeah, for once. pay attention? If they don't not, care about hearing it, they Frank, get Frank, somewhere Frank, else. Frank, okay. Quiet. Frank, I'll take care of it. Okay. Having, yeah, uh, Frank, just, you know, I'll take care of it. Yeah, this have, everybody, you have a chance for a discussion later on, okay? Let's just have one full meeting, one thing. I'm talking right now. 
and uh, you guys just uh, you know hold tight and you'll get your chance okay the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing not competitive boy those plastic Chinese are sure clever because China is suffering from a lot of the same effects from climate disruptions we are right now they must be very very smart or very very masochistic and again uh, promoting the sort of sustainable things that we're going to get into can help make our manufacturing more competitive. Next we have our best buddy Scott Pruitt, Environmental Protection Agency. Pruitt is a climate change denier with a record of opposing rules that cut emissions from polluters. In an op-ed last year, Pruitt questioned the science behind climate change, erroneously arguing that the link between global warming and human activity is unclear. Since his appointment, Pruitt has been pushing to delay and roll back common sense public health and safety regulations. Quote, scientists continue to disagree about the degree and extent of global warming and its connection to the actions of mankind. The consensus is clear, and we've talked about this before, but there's something I want to point out briefly. Scott Pruitt has gone so far as to recommend debates by scientists on TV so the public can hear. Not debating the, the policy, but debating climate science. And again, we can get into that, but it's basically designed to create more doubt and confusion. And we can discuss that later on. We have Rick Perry, another one of our friends, the Department of Energy. Rick Perry once vowed to eliminate the Department of Energy, the very department he now leads. Until recently, he sat on the board of the company that is building the Dakota Access Pipeline. During his 2016 presidential run, he said he would approve the Keystone XL pipeline on day one. The science is not settled on this climate change. The idea that we would put America's economy at jeopardy based on scientific theory that's not settled to me is just nonsense. Those are typical deni climate me. denier and delayer talking points. Again, the science is pretty much settled. The uncertainties are built into what's going on. We can discuss that later. And we're not putting the economy in jeopardy. In fact, we're going to improve the economy and put people back to work. We have Ryan Zinke, Zinke, Department of the Interior. As a congressman from Montana, Ryan Zinke consistently voted to weaken clean air standards, dismantle environmental regulations that protect people's health, and expand fossil fuel exploration on public lands. He is a supporter of the Keystone XL pipeline and has labeled climate change not a hoax, but not proven science either. The war on coal, I believe, is real. Okay, well, Charlie, as a part of his promotion, put on the website and also sent this out, a picture of Donald Trump at a uh, campaign rally on an eastern uh, coal state having Trump digs coal. Oh, hilarious. Oh, ho, ho. Making America great again. What, what, what a load of crap. Uh, we could spend an entire evening talking about the coal industry, the impacts of coal, black lung disease and coal miners, coal mining accidents, um, regulatory laxity, um, the hazards of mountaintop removal coal mining, uh, the hazards of hazardous coal ash, so on and so forth. And this is not this presentation, but it certainly uh, is a part of our it's a part of our discussion this evening. And last but not least, we have our good buddy Jeff Sessions, our U.S. Attorney General. As Attorney General, Jeff Sessions appoints key leaders within the Department of Justice, including the Assistant Attorney General of the Environment. Yet Sessions is a climate change denier and he has opposed nearly every piece of global warming and environmental legislation during his 20-year career as a U.S. Senator. Carbon dioxide is CO2, and that's really not a pollutant, that's a plant food. And it doesn't harm anyone except that it might include temperature increases. It definitely does include temperature increases. CO2 is the primary greenhouse gas. The U.S. Supreme Court in its landmark uh, 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 in a landmark decision, gave the U.S. EPA authority to regulate CO2 as a uh, climate-producing uh, pollution. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Don't worry, don't worry about it. Okay, next we're going to go on to uh, Save the Endangered Species Act campaign. This is from EDF Action, advocacy partner of Environmental Defense Fund. This was sent on February 20th of, of this year. 
to Senator Richard J. Durbin, Tammy Duckworth, and then Representative Janice D. Schakowsky. As a longtime conservation biology activist, I am deeply concerned about the threats to roll back the Endangered Species Act. I am calling on you to safeguard America's wildlife, plants, and their ecosystems by voting against any effort to weaken this important law. It is our duty as Americans that we protect these threatened species so that they may recover and thrive. And I included a little note with the petition that goes, intelligent tinkering means saving all the parts. That's a, a paraphrase of a quote by Aldo Leopold, one of the giants from the conservation era in this country, uh, who wrote the classic A Sand County Almanac. This is Stop Trump's Attack on Endangered Species from the Endangered Species Coalition, Tuesday, June 6th of last year. And I've uh, updated and I've uh, updated and uh, edited this information. The 2017 spending plan from President Trump cuts funds for new endangered species listings by almost 17 percent, eliminated funding for key science programs at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, slashed budgets for already underfunded underfunded endangered species recovery programs. It even eliminated the wolf livestock loss demonstration program that assists livestock owners co-existing with wolves. The Endangered Species Act is one of the most successful and supported laws on the nation's books. As a 99% effectiveness rate at preventing extinction it is supported by 90% of American voters. Okay. Next we move to the Destruction of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, but let's be positive, let's flip the coin, let's work to save the U.S. EPA. During the 1980s, so those of you that were around, remember, during the 1980s, uh, the cabinet member who was the lightning rod of activism for environmentalists was Interior Secretary James Watt, although Ronald Reagan was the real James Watt. Now, it's uh, Scott Pruitt. He's the lightning rod of uh, activism. And uh, this is a uh, petition from EDF Action. It's a people's petition calling for Scott Pruitt's dismissal as head of the Environmental Protection Agency. We, the people, find EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt in violation of his sworn oath to, quote, well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which I am about to enter, unquote. We find that instead of discharging his duties as America's top environmental enforcement official, Mr. Pruitt has implemented a plan, a program to gut the EPA from within and slash funding for clean air, clean water, toxic waste, and other environmental safeguards. We find that he has repeatedly met with industry representatives and special interests while only allocating a fraction of his time to meet with public health experts scientists or environmental policy advocates. We find that he has d disregarded the scientific findings of his own agency and with little or no public input or debate has proposed policies to block, delay, or weaken dozens of environmental safeguards. This reckless agenda has been pursued as a, at a pace unpre unprecedented in the 47 year history of the EPA and has put millions of Americans at greater risk of environmental harm. We find that he has sidelined and silenced scientists and policy experts within his agency and replaced them with a cadre of lobbyists and public relations specialists who built their careers undermining the environment and advocating for special interests in polluters. We find that he has spent tens of thousands of taxpayer dollars on lavish trips home with no clear explanation of what his official duties are on these trips. We find that he has operated in secrecy not divulging his calendar of official duties and spending nearly $25,000 on a secure phone booth in his office to conduct business in the dark, even keeping his own staff out of the loop. We find that in these and other actions, Scott Pruitt is holding polluter interests ahead of the public good and is unfit for the office he holds. For these reasons, we call for Scott Pruitt's dismissal. That was sent on February 10th of this year. This is from uh, Friends of the Earth, sent uh, March 23rd of last year, um, telling the senators, of course, um, Dick Durbin and Tammy Duckworth, to, uh, to, to save the U.S. EPA. Bills have been introduced in Congress to everything from cutting the U.S. EPA's budget by 25 percent 
to completely eliminating the agency. The US EPA has the mission of protecting public health and environmental quality, not worrying about the excessive profits of the fossil fuel and chemical industries. As a longtime environmental activist, I remember when Richard M. Nixon signed the legislation passed with bipartisan support by the U.S. Congress to establish the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, U.S. EPA. The public support for tougher, cleaner air and water regulations and effective federal toxic chemical waste superfund cleanup program cuts across income levels, educational background, age, sex, political affiliation, and geography. I was disgusted to learn that President Donald Trump's spending plan for fiscal year 18, fiscal year 2018, includes deep cuts to the US EPA's budget. These cuts will undermine efforts to combat climate disruption and protect us from air and water pollution. I urge you to oppose Trump's proposed budget and any budget proposal that includes cuts to our environmental uh, program. We move on to something else to, uh, again, Tammy Duckworth, Dick Durbin, and my representative, Jan Schakowsky. Save the Great Lakes from the Trump administration. This is from the Sierra Club, and it was sent on August 25th of uh, last year. Save the Great Lakes. The Trump administration has proposed an agenda that threatens our Great Lakes. Proposed drastic cuts to the Environmental Protection Agency, including 100% of the funding for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, GLRI, cuts to science and enforcement efforts, and policy rollbacks that threaten Great Lakes water quality, all threaten the source of drinking water and priceless ecosystems. These dangerous proposals are a shocking abandonment of crucial successful efforts to protect our drinking water and the most important natural resource for our entire region. Great Lakes cleanup efforts have been a tremendous success, but our lakes and communities are still at risk. The GLRI program and work of the EPA has protected our drinking water, created thousands of good jobs, protected public health, and kept beaches and fisheries open, supporting a way of life for millions of people. However, our lakes are still threatened by invasive species, nutrient pollution, power plant discharges, climate change, and other threats. Our communities are at risk from lead and other contaminants in our drinking water. We all need to do our part to protect our Great Lakes. I'm taking the Great Lakes Protection Pledge, and I urge you to do the same. We move on now into the continuing climate science denial, climate policy delay of the Trump administration. This is was sent on Monday, November 6th of last year. This is from the, the Sierra Club. Trump doesn't represent me. I'm still in and support climate action in the Paris Agreement. I'm appalled by Donald Trump's lack of concern about the climate crisis. His intention to leave the landmark Paris Climate Agreement will forever damage America's climate leadership. I count myself among nearly 70% of Americans who support the Paris Agreement. With or without Trump, I pledge to stand up for climate action and efforts to fulfill our commitments under the Paris Agreement. Again, we've already said this is an update. He withdrew from the Paris Climate Agreement with the urging of Scott Pruitt. In case you didn't know that, that's the not so behind the scenes news. Now you can add a personal message, and this is my personal message. We require resistance to the challenge of climate science denial, climate policy delay, and empowerment for the opportunity of climate action to protect the Earth's climate system. Climate protection is good for American business and industry and will enhance our economic well-being. Immediate and decisive action is essential to tackle the most defining issue of our time, human-caused climate disruption. Rather than being a hoax orchestrated by the Chinese, the reality of human-made climate chaos will define how we will live by determining our energy systems, transportation systems, food systems, water systems, security systems, and health systems. I'm one of the original modern environmental energy conservation activists ever since around the very first Earth Day celebration, Wednesday, April 22nd, 1970, which was more than 47 years ago. Now, being the severity or gravity that it is now, our climate problem was referred to as the greenhouse effect back then. I have a Bachelor of Science B.S. degree in Biology and Environmental Studies from Vienna College, Florida, Nebraska. I want to clarify part of that. I didn't say that climate was not an issue back then. Climate disrupting gases were being released to the atmosphere, but it was not obviously the issue that it was now. It was Earth Day proper. That night on the evening news, I saw a depiction of the greenhouse effect, and for the first time thought, we really got to do something about that. 
that there wasn't the climate justice movement that there was now. We move on and go into something else about climate. This is from Credo Action that was sent August 21st of last year. Tell the Inspector General of the Department of the Interior, investigate the censoring of government scientists and experts. The petition to the Inspector General of the Department of the Interior reads, quote, censoring experts for doing their jobs is an abuse of authority. Launch an investigation into the Department of the, the Interior Secretary Zinke's arbitrary reassignment of Joel Clement and 50 other senior uh, officials and scientists, unquote. Joel Clement was the top climate change scientist at the Department of the Interior until last month. That's when Trump's department chief quietly banished him to an accounting job where he processes royalty payments from fossil fuel companies. Clement is one of, the, of about 50 scientists and senior officials quietly removed from their posts at the Department of the Interior in July. He believes he was punished for speaking out about the climate risks facing Alaska native villages. Let's move on to renegotiating NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. This is from Credo Action. It was sent September 5th of last year. Replace NAFTA. No more pro-corporate trade deals. Petition to U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer. Quote, do not use the pro-corporate Trans-Pacific Partnership as a starting point in your efforts to renegotiate the North American Free Trade Agreement in open and transparent negotiating process, eliminate the investor state dispute settlement system that surrenders sovereignty to corporate power, include strong and enforceable labor and environmental standards, require all imports to meet the strongest safety <coughs> domestic safety standards, reinforce by American and by local policies, and remove rules that drive up drug prices by allowing pharmaceutical monopolies. And this is along the lines, this is sent on May 20th of last year, this is from the uh, Sierra Club, um, sent to uh, Jan Schakowsky, uh, Tammy Duckworth, and Dick Durbin. The renegotiation of NAFTA must benefit people's real needs and our climate system. I cannot be more honest by saying NAFTA has been a disaster for our environment. NAFTA empowered corporate polluters to challenge environmental protections, boosted destructive mining in Mexico, and contributed to the rise of Canada's inherently dirtier and toxic tar sands industry. The Sierra Club and many of our, national, of our nation's leading environmental organizations recently laid out eight essential changes to NAFTA. Any renegotiation of NAFTA should be driven by a desire for climate action, cleaner air and water, healthier communities, and good American jobs. I am disgusted by the fact that President Donald Trump is stacking his cabinet full of billionaire supporters of status quo trade deals and climate deniers delayers, and I am concerned that his renegotiation will actually be worse for environmental quality. As we begin to negotiate NAFTA and chart a new path for fair trade, not free trade, I call upon you to make sure that any renegotiation of NAFTA benefits people's real needs and our climate system, not multinational corporations. Let's continue on to another topic. Stop Trump from starting a nuclear war. Uh, this is from a Credo Action, March 3rd of, of last year. The petition to Congress reads, Donald Trump currently has unrestricted power to launch thousands of nuclear weapons at will. Support H.R. 669, the Restricting the First Use of Nuclear Weapons Act, to stop him from starting a nuclear war. Senator Ed Markey and Senator Ted Liu introduced legislation, the Restricting the First Use of Nuclear Weapons Act, that would limit Trump's ability to launch nuclear weapons without an act of Congress. And along the same lines, this is also from Credo Action, sent November 8th of last year, tell Congress no unauthorized war in North Korea. And the petition to Congress reads, quote, pass the Preventing Preemptive War in North Korea Act of 2017, unquote. Trump's Pentagon told lawmakers that the only way the United States could locate and secure North Korea's nuclear weapons is through an invasion of ground troops. We're talking about a real ground combat war with North Korea. Officials testifying before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee confirmed what progressives have been afraid of. If Donald Trump decides to initiate a 
attack on North Korea, even with a nuclear weapon, it's likely that no one, not even Congress, would be able to stop them. The Preventing Preventive War in North Korea Act of 2017 would provide a vital check to Trump's power by prohibiting him from initiating a nuclear war with North Korea without explicit authorization from Congress. Well, our future is very much in our hands, and there's a stringent condition which must be made. No more time really can be wasted. Sensitive to human-caused climate disruption as much as to the threat of nuclear war, the long or the minute arm of the infamous doomsday clock in the Chicago publication, both in the Atomic Scientist, was reset on January 26th of last year to read two and a half minutes to midnight from three minutes to midnight in 2016. They refer to it as a Trump effect. Yeah, making America great. It's, 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 it's garbage. It's, it's just garbage marketing. This marked the uh, direst setting of the doomsday clock since 1983 at the height of the Cold War during the Reagan years. Now, if you think that was bad enough, I checked, and this year the doomsday clock was reset to read two minutes to midnight. In other words, it was moved ahead 30 seconds. So uh, you can all uh, sleep uh, more peacefully tonight, I guess, because of that. And we must take this symbol of urgency very seriously. Have a couple questions for you. What is worse, climate disruption or nuclear war? What would be the ecological effects of nuclear war? They're not very pleasant uh, uh, questions, aren't they? <laughs> well, here are some perspectives of information to shed some light on these questions, and we focus our attention during this Earth Day weekend on an important topic. Dr. Austin Babro, a professor in the School of Communication Studies at Ohio University, who specializes in environmental communication, said that climate disruption is potentially quite a bit worse than war. To begin with, climate disruption will make war more likely. In other words, climate disruption will make war, entails the heightened prospect of war. There is evidence that climate disruption is already contributing to wars in various places. Quote, moreover, climate change doesn't only threaten the death, destruction, and suffering of war, but also innumerable nasty consequences, some regional, some global. Droughts, fires, water shortages, floods, collapse of the ocean's fish, fish stocks, cascading species dis extinction, widespread famine, spreading disease, and population displacements that will dwarf those already inflaming them, the Middle East, Africa, and Europe." Unquote. According to the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, a nuclear war between the United States and Soviet Union fought with only 1,000 nuclear weapons, around 5% of the total global stockpiles would render the planet uninhabitable. A regional nuclear war between India and Pakistan using 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons, 13 kilotons each, would disrupt the global climate and agricultural production so uh, severely that over 1 billion people will be of risk of famine. While it would not result in the extinction of the human race, it would probably bring about the end to modern civilization as we know it. Not very cheery subjects. We must work to avoid the consequences from out of control, runaway climate disruption, and any type of nuclear war. Debating what, what's worse, climate disruption or nuclear war, is like debating where to put the uh, deck chairs up on the Titanic as the ship's going down. Okay. I'm a big ocean advocate. We're going to move on to a, an excellent action alert. I signed my name on to these comments. This is from Oceana, an ocean advocacy group, sent August 14th of last year. And uh, to tell the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to preserve existing measures to protect our ocean and save marine life, because the Trump administration is attacking our ocean protections. I urge the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, to maintain the current regulations and regulatory processes in order to implement our nation's fundamental environmental laws. In light of Executive Orders 13766, 13771, 13777, and 13783, NOAA is seeking comment on outdated, ineffective, or unnecessary regulations. NOAA issues regulations to implement many of our nation's key environmental laws, including the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, and the Coastal Zone Management Act. 
These laws and associated regulations are essential to the well-being of our oceans and coastal communities and are important drivers to our local economy, to our national economy, I mean, well, also local economy, but to the national economy. <clears throat> I recommend that NOAA reach a committee rollbacks or weakening of its vital environmental regulations under the guise of streamlining or reducing regulatory burden. I object to the false premise that public safeguards represent an unnecessary regulatory burden on our nation. Environmental protection saves lives, improve businesses while allowing for promoting economic growth and providing for more and benefits than they cost. There is no evidence that NOAA regulations burden industry unnecessarily. In fact, the, in the Office of Management, in the Office of Management and Budget's most recent report, analyzing the benefits and costs of federal regulation, the estimated net benefits of major federal regulations between 2009 and 2015 was in the range of 103 billion and 393 billion dollars. Since they began issuing the report in 1997, OMB's analysis has repeatedly shown that the benefits of federal regulation outweigh the costs. In addition, NOAA consistently engages in regulatory impact reviews for all regulatory actions that are of public interest to ensure that the agency systematically and comprehensively considers all available alternatives so that public welfare can be enhanced in the most efficient and cost-effective way. NOAA's broad comments on, quote, any existing agency regulation, unquote, is unprecedented and unnecessary. NOAA's regulations, including those specifically identified in the Federal Register Notice, were probably promulgated in accordance with the Administrative Procedure Act. Thus, NOAA has already received comments from the public on its regulations, and I'm one of the people who commented, in fact. There is no reason to believe that after the comprehensive process of promulgating, promulgating regulations, NOAA's regulations are obsolete, ineffective, or counterproductive. Rather, it appears that this exercise is driven by an ideological opposition to all regulation, no matter how necessary to address practical problems, conserve the environment, promote the economy, or comply with the law. Indeed, it appears in the Federal Register notice that the administration wants to create a one-way ratchet, seeking only negative input and not seeking to hear about the benefits of regulation. The notice is calculated to solicit comments from special interests voicing their displeasure with protections that help the people, to help, that help the public, and protect the environment for the benefit of all Americans. NOAA ought to be asking for guidance on how to better carry out its mission of conserving and managing our coastal and marine ecosystems and resources, not how to retreat from it. NOAA must maintain all current regulatory processes, especially those uh, promulgated to implement our nation's environmental laws. I urge NOAA staff and any other decision makers involved in the review and review process to reject any attempts to roll back or weaken NOAA's existing regulations or regulatory processes. I understand here at the college we have a lot of things going on with it. people coming in and, and uh, drinking water and uh, if I, mean, I hope that you guys got the gist of what that is saying because I couldn't have written it better myself. I know when I'm not talking to the general public, you do a lot of you come virtually every week more than I do, but it's important to understand those arguments when you go out and talk to other people who just are bashing, oh, it's over-regulation, or it's the government, or some horse crap, like let the free market decide, <laughs> you can counter with the, some of this stuff. Because the, the, the free market is not a solution to all, all of our problems, believe me. <laughs> Let's continue. Another one from Oceana. June 3rd, uh, 2017, that... Uh, to, uh, to save our national, our marine national monuments. This went to Wilbur L. Ross, Department of Commerce, and Ryan Zinke, Department of the Interior. I call on you to protect and preserve the United States Marine National Monuments and the authority to all presidents to protect our nation's special places. National Marine Monuments protect ocean treasures by preserving unique and critical habitats that are home to countless coral, fish, and other marine life. Research 
has shown that marine protected areas allow fish populations to replenish and food webs to rebuild, resulting in an increase in the abundance and diversity of ocean life both inside and outside the protected area. Essentially, the more fish and marine mammals populate an area, the more they venture beyond the monument's borders, providing increased opportunities for fishing and nature-based tourism. Marine national monuments also help to reduce the ocean stressors by providing vital services such as increased ocean resilience and ecosystem diversity to reduce the risk of losing key species and habitats. For instance, a recent study in the U.S. Palmyra Atoll located in the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument found that large marine protected areas, quote, can enforceably benefit vulnerable reef sharks and other mobile species if properly enforced, unquote. We oppose the unprecedented reversal of monument designations by previous presidents. Do not attempt to withdraw monument designations for any monuments, including the brand new Northeast Canyons and Sea Mounts in the Atlantic Ocean, which again I was in favor of their designation. Please fulfill their du your duties as Secretaries of Commerce and Interior to adequately manage America's resources in keeping our national monuments intact. Um, move on to the uh, Trump administration's food and agricultural policy. The Chicago Park District, I'm oh, sorry, not Park District, sorry. Chicago, Chicago Park District that's going to add has a lot of has a lot of programs going on with cleanups and everything regarding uh, Earth Day and Earth Day weekend. Uh, with the food and agricultural policy, so the, the Chicago Public Library's 2016-2017 One Book One Chicago Season celebrated the 10th anniversary edition of Animal Vegetable Miracle, a year of food life by Barbara Kingsolver with Stephen L. Hop, Camille Kingsolver and Lily Hop King Solver by exploring the theme of eat, think, and grow. This is a superb book. It's a narrative I recommend everybody to see. Barbara King Solver is a walking, talking, living, breathing encyclopedia of eating healthy, eating sustainably. Um, Dr. Stephen L. Hop, her husband, is an environmental biologist who teaches at Amory and Henry College. And Camille and Lily Hop King Solver are their two daughters. Um, what they did is they packed up and they left their home in the outskirts of Tucson, Arizona, and moved to their farm in northwestern Virginia in the Appalachian region. And for one year, this was an experiment, they decided to eat locally, regionally, seasonably, and it's a, it was a big success. And again, I'd recommend the book for everybody to, uh, to, to read. Uh, she's an award-winning author. She writes excellent fiction and creative nonfiction. This is this is, is creative nonfiction, and Dr. Hop uh, wrote the uh, sections on and uh, like the environmental problems connected with agriculture and what we should be doing about them. The Chicago Public Library System had about 80 different events exploring Eat, Think, and Grow. On Thursday, May 18th of last year, the event, the season finale, featured. Barbara Kingsolver and Stephen L. Hopp themselves at the Harold Washington Library's auditorium for a presentation and book signing. Of course, I had to be there. I had already read the library's co copy of the book. Mr. This is the. Can you repeat, um, after? Can you repeat uh, again, author? This would Barbara Kingsolver. Bar Barbara Kingsolver. Possible on Google. Yes, yes, she, it does. Can we, yeah, let's, yeah, she can, let's, can we, she, can we continue with the presentation? Yeah, she can Google her, and she's an award winning. Can you last name again? King Solver, K-I-N-G-S-O-L-V-E-R, King Solver, two words together. And I was there for the presentation and book signing. The book signing went well, I mean, the, uh, the presentation went well. It was a PowerPoint she presented. And the question and answer session started. The questions were good. I decided to kind of stir the pot a little bit. Let's liven things up. So I stood up. I thanked them both for coming to Chicago. I asked two questions. What do you think about the uh, Trump administration's food and agricultural policy? What do you think of uh, Sonny Perdue as Secretary of Agriculture? <laughs> Silence. <laughs> Except there was some laughter and some, you know, giggling in the audience because they were anticipating her answer. And said, she said nothing, vigorously, shaking her head, no, just like this. Just like, 
With comedic timing, Steve and her husband steps forward. Next question, please. Uh, the whole audience burst out laughter, and I was one of the loudest because it wasn't a blow off. She, by her silence and by her body language, said exactly what you know a lot of people in the audience were assuming her to do. And Stephen said something briefly about corporate agribusiness. Well, I went up afterwards for the book signing. Stephen recognized me and goes, Oh, you're the one who asked about the Trump administration. Sure. See, I'm there. I'm out there. Well, I'm a mover and shaker, I'm making things happen, I'm going to these events, being recognized. We had a bit of a chat, because I'm in my undergraduate degree, because he's got his doctorate. And he said that like in, in, in the 10 years, the sections on in the environmental science area that he wrote for the book, you know, could be updated, which I'm, I'm quite in, in agreement with. So, I mean, highly, a highly recommended book again. This is something else. This is something from, uh, something else about the food and agricultural policy from the Center of Biological Diversity from Tucson, Arizona, dated Friday, May 19th of last year. Healthy, sustainable diets start with school lunches. Yet one of Sunny Purdue's first actions as Trump's agriculture secretary was to roll back health requirements for the National School Lunch Program. The standards have been in place for years and were widely supported by public health and environmental organizations and cafeterias across the country have been successfully creating healthier, kid-friendly school lunches, but now that progress is at, is at risk. Tens of thousands of meals are served every day as a part of the school lunch program, giving schools a massive influence on our food system and climate. As more cafeterias adopt meatless Mondays and take steps to improve the sustainability of their menus, they're helping to reduce meat consumption and tackle food waste. We're committed to working with schools and other institutions who want to keep serving food that's better for both people and the planet, and amen to that. Then we'll continue with food and agriculture. This is an update. This is about our good buddy Sam Clovis. Do you remember Mr. Clovis? From Credo Action, dated August 29th of last year. Reject Sam Clovis, no racist climate deniers at USDA. The petition to the Senate reads, quote, Sam Clovis is a racist climate change denier with zero experience in food and agriculture policy. Reject his nomination to be chief scientist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He's not a scientist, but he was a right-wing talk show host in Sioux City, Nebraska, to, in Sioux City, Iowa. I don't know if you knew that, so I guess that, in Donald Trump's mind, makes him uh, qualified to be a the chief scientist at USDA. His name was, was his, as an update, his name was withdrawn from consideration after it came up in regards to the ongoing investigation of the Soviet influence on our uh, last presidential election. Okay, boys and girls, here we go with a topic that's uh, been ongoing. It's just a, a continuation and a different question. What role do energy markets and governmental intervention have in determining our energy policy? Unfortunately, Donald Trump is strongly in favor of nuclear power. An article in the Huffington Post, March 11, 2017, the 6th anniversary of the beginning of Japan's Fukushima nuclear disaster, asked the pertinent question, does Donald Trump have the business sense to pull the financial plug on nuclear power? On the front cover, Forbes magazine, February 1986, points out that, quote, the failure of the U.S. nuclear power program ranks as the largest managerial disaster in American business history, unquote. The fact that nuclear power is bad business remains true to this day, even with so-called new and advanced reactor designs. Since the 1970s, Wall Street has refused to finance nuclear power. The pro-nuclear cheerleaders then went to the federal government for support, and received 100% loan guarantees for new nuclear reactor construction. Because of skyrocketing costs, these loans might pay for five reactors and only expand our electrical supply by less than 1%. On June 16th of last year, I attended an interesting panel discussion entitled, Let's Make a Deal! The Path Forward on Energy and Climate Policy at the University of Chicago. One of the questions considered was, what role will energy markets play in determining policy? This is according to the report entitled, Global Trends and RE Investment 2017, RE referring to renewable energy, of course. It seems that record newer renewable power capacity was added worldwide at lower cost for 2016. 
wind, solar, and renewables added 138 gigawatts to our global power capacity in, in 2016, up 8% from the 127.5 gigawatts added in 2015. A gigawatt is equivalent to a large, average size, large nuclear reactor. So in other words, during, 19, during 2016, renewable sources of energy provided the equivalent of 138 new big nuclear reactors. At the same time, it's interesting to note that the investment levels in renewables fell in 2016 largely because of falling costs. The average dollar capital expenditures per megawatt for solar photovoltaics and wind turbines dropped by over 10%. And this is a good thing because investors are getting more bang for less buck. This positive situation in our energy markets will continue to drive the global shift toward renewables. The Trump administration's regressive pro-nuclear power and anti-climate action policy is just going to try to get in the way and impede progress. And uh, this is from Environment, Environment America, said May 23rd of last year, to our buddy, uh, Secretary of Energy, Rick Perry. Don't undermine state renewable standards. I am concerned by your recent comments hinting that you might intervene with state renewable energy standards. 29 states now have renewable energy standards, and if we're serious about avoiding the worst impacts of global warming and getting to 100% renewable energy, we should encourage more to join them. Please stay out of the way of states who are acting to improve their communities by pursuing stronger renewable energy policies. And Illinois, by the way, is one of them. We live in the real world of energy choices, and in our real world of energy options, we have political biases like the almost religious zeal for the status quo of fossil fuels and nuclear power, and equitable market conditions like massive nuclear power and fossil fuel subsidies, and in externalities, what the environmental economists would call them, like fossil fuel and nuclear power pollution. All three of these things create energy market distortions which require governmental intervention. My write-up says we also have to contend with the extreme uh, agenda of the Republican Party itself, and I have some excerpts from the 2016 GOP platform. Repeal environmental laws, pretty much a no-brainer, <coughs> and federal funding for Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood provides essential reproductive health services. I'm adding this one. It's not really connected, directly connected with Earth Day, but it's connected with a part of the Republican Party's attack on science. Oppose stem cell scientific research. Last Earth Day proper, I participated in the March for Science Chicago down in the loop, and there were some of the marchers that had signs that supported stem cell research. No labeling of GMO ingredients in food products, again, GMOs, genetically modified organisms. Here's one we can talk about that I've done a lot on. Open America's shores to more oil and gas drilling. Build the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, expand fracking and burying nuclear waste. No tax on carbon products. Ignore, climate ch ignore global climate change agreements. Build a border wall to keep immigrants out. According to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, an impenetrable U.S.-Mexico border wall would potentially impact about 111 endangered species and some 108 migratory bird species. Replace sex education with abstinence-only approaches. I think it's okay for teenagers to be taught to say no. There's no problem with that. But you need to be combining that with the birth control services at the same time. And last but not least, cancel Iran nuclear treaty and expand nuclear arsenal. So where do we go from here? What do we do? Well, my uh, write-up uh, briefly explains what we need to do as far as a program. And we can get into the nuts and bolts later on about this. What we need is a good, solid, progressive, populist agenda for public and environmental health, climate protection, eco-justice, economic well-being, and national global security, and make America an even greater nation. Now. The protesters have a right. I have no problems about resisting Trump. You see, the signs resist Trump. But my sales and fundraising experience, and I don't think a lot of people know I have that, you have to flip that coin over and talk about empower. You have to empower people, empowerment. Empower people to move to a higher level. 
And I was just thinking about these very things when I picked up, it was from last year, the June 15th uh, issue of The Reader. I almost hit the floor because no other than Naomi Klein basically vindicates my point of view. You know, author Naomi Klein, this changes everything. Right. Now she comes out with the book, No, It's Not Enough. It, it, it is. It's not enough. And basically says along the same things I'm saying. She has a young son. Uh, he talks about it in this book again. Hope trumps no. That's the article that the cover story of Sierra Coast Magazine, again by Naomi Clark. She has a four-year-old son that got scared because of all the, the scary stuff about climate and everything. Kids can get scared. You would, if people can get depressed. But we need to uh, look at the brighter side, work to solve the problems, join together, and let's uh, trump trump. Okay? Uh, that's it for the presentation. Thanks for your patience. And now, I'll open the questions. Dennis, do you need a moderator up there, or could you get your uh, questions? I'll handle, I can handle that, I think, myself. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, I'll take you first, young lady. So, no camera, no camera. Oh, man. No camera. Yes, camera. No camera. Yes, camera. Okay, uh, my first question, are you vegetarian? And what do you think about vegetarian in general? People vegetarian, you know, they don't eat meat. Oh, veggies? So, okay, so vegetarian. protecting the environment. And my next question is... Well, let's take one at a time, okay? I'm not a complete vegetarian, I'll admit that. Vegetarian, vegetarianism, veganism has its own merits. Again, I, um, um, I, I think that there's delicious vegetarian food. I think the vegetarian, the natural, organic, has moved, is moving more and more into the mainstream. If you go to a place like Whole Foods Market to the frozen food section, you see frozen, very delicious frozen dinners as I purchased. No GMOs, uh, nothing like that. And that's, it's an inevitable. Because people come home, they're tired from work, and they want to have something easy, or I'm a bachelor, and I want a quick bachelor meal. You're not going to spend a lot of time cooking unless you're going to, and I love leftovers, unless you're going to eat the leftovers. So therefore, you uh, you have these, these uh, convenience the meals that are, but to answer the question, I support vegetarianism and veganism. I'm not a complete vegetarian myself, but again, I did have the, uh, the, the, uh, the tilapia, uh, for tonight's uh, for dinner, of course, Cajun style is the way I like my fish. <laughs> At the same time, see if people want to go, you know, vegetarianism, you know, more power to them. Okay, and my yes. Question: So, what do you think? Uh, maybe it's going to be a little bit. See, I don't want a camera. Okay. Okay. Anyhow, um, so you have to speak up. Okay. Um, so, what do you think about? I know question may be silly, but maybe not. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. some UFO. <laughs> Aliens like just give a question once and for all. With the weather and the climate, what, yes. do you, what do you think? That UFOs are making the weather. <laughs> UFOs, some, some UFOs. Oh, you're about. saying that? That's a question really more for Andy. In fact, that's something that. <laughs> I didn't really like. I don't think that people realize this. I've never really discussed this. I'm going to discuss this, and, I, and I've never done a presentation on it. I was very much interested in junior high school on unexplained phenomena, particularly UFOs. In fact, I wanted in my junior high school years to start a UFO club at my junior high school. This, this uh, issue resurfaced when I was in college. In fact, I was considered the, the campus expert on unexplained phenomena, and particularly UFOs. So this is not something I've said, now I've said it, so Andy's not the only one. I usually don't make a comment about it, because I don't want to get off on the tangent, but you asked the question. Basically the answer is no, that they, they're, we have to look at what UFOs are. UFOs could be different things, it's a scientific question that needs examination. Uh, at one time I wanted to be, I actually signed, I wanted to sign up for an investigator for the Center for UFO Studies after meeting J. Allen Hynek himself, I think he passed away. He's a Northwestern astrophysicist who is a consultant to the Air Force on UFOs. No, there's no evidence that UFOs have any direct bearing on climate, as there's no direct bearing that the sun is responsible, that internal heating in the Earth's core is responsible. We have to, first off, getting, we have to determine what UFOs are because there's different uh, explanations that have been given for UFOs. Different UFOs could, could be different things, and that's all I want to say. Concerning what we know about climate, we know that there are basically human foot, human climate fingerprints all over. 
like the heating of the troposphere, the cooling of the stratosphere, and other things that show that we are having an effect upon the climate. That's the 97% consensus among the climate scientists that publish in peer-reviewed scientific publications. And that's basically the consensus view that most of the activity that you're seeing, most of the warming, and again, weather is from day to day, and climate is over a 30-year period. Some people get those two things mixed up when you discuss with the average person. But most of the warming that's taking place now is due to our activities, inefficient combustion of fossil fuels, deforestation, and also from agriculture. I hope I answered your question. You asked a lot of good questions even during the presentation, so that's good. Um, yes, sir. Do, do, do you think Trump did a good thing to face down Kim's nuclear weapons and also Abbas's uh, chemical uh, barrel bombs? That he, that he faced them both down. The thing is, you see, that's a part of the reason why the, the bulletin atomic scientist clock is moving closer and closer to midnight because of Trump's saber rattling. In the United Nations uh, address, if you remember, Trump said that we would destroy North Korea and the North Korean delegation walked out. I mean, what we need is negotiation. We need uh, to respect each other and understand that we need to negotiate, not just saber rattling. In terms of the, the thing in Syria, that's one of the that's one of the issues. I don't know if people know that's really the, the basis for the conflicts in, in in Syria are actually climate driven. And that was one of the points that I didn't add. And in terms of doing that, I probably so. But the problem with Trump is, see, Trump is not looking at. Trump is not looking at cause and effect. This is the, the problem I have with the foreign policy under the right wing Republican. Let me let me just let me finish. Let, don't, don't get people get. I'm giving answers to a lot of these questions. I anticipated, and some are off the cuff. I kind of anticipated that somebody might mention this. You see, you're talking about the the, the links, the circle, the links between war and climate. Are war making activities put more? <clears throat> junk into the atmosphere, which makes the climate problem worse, with uh, worsening food and water shortages and everything. We have increased wars, and then it's like a circle, a cycle. I was one of the organizers for the NATO protests, and I was one of the media spokespersons. That was one of the things that we talked about, was breaking the climate um, war link. So the trouble is, with Trump is, you, I, I think they're probably so, uh, but you have to look at cause and effect. I mean, look at all the stuff that he's done to deny climate. He's not going to... These Republicans and Trump are looking at the back end. They're looking at the back end, looking at what we need to do to bomb that the heck out of people instead of looking at cause and effect, what we do at the beginning to reduce conflicts, and that's to accept the reality of climate disruption and, and, keep a, and, and support these international climate agreements. But Obama didn't do anything. He took the red line and, and uh, Assad, Assad walked right over it. And also, <coughs> also Trump sent, uh, uh, what's his name over there? Uh, uh, the uh, Secretary of State, Pompeo. He sent him over there. That's negotiation. Well, that's, that's a good point. I'm just saying that, that in terms of North Korea, that's, uh, that's something that, again, I mean, uh, the experts at the Bulletin Atomic Scientists, again, have, have moved the clock closer to midnight, which means that we need to reduce the conflict and we need to yeah. be moving it back. So, um, um, How about the edits? I don't really, I really quite frankly can't answer the question about what Obama, what Obama did or didn't do, to be honest with you. I haven't looked into that that much, Look actually. what he did with Iran. That they, he made it so that they can have more nuclear weapons. Well, I support the I support the treaty with Iran. I think it's a good step in the right direction, and to scuttle it, I think, is a big mistake. Let's now let's go to this side of the room. Okay. Um, about the solar panels, I, I know they uh, got some kind of additional charge now on solar panels from, from China, but who's making solar panels in this country, and we're not making them fast enough, or what's the demand? Do you know anything about? the process of, or, and who's making them in this country? You're talking about the tariff that uh, Trump put on uh, Chinese goods. See, Chinese has become the, the world leader in production of a solar panel. Again, see, this is cause and effect, see. We're, we're surrendering our manufacturing priorities in this area into fossil fuels and nuclear power. In fact, uh, one of the references that the Friends of the Earth had was that at the Bond climate talks that 
Trump is going to push coal and nuclear power, which again, making America great, I don't think so. See, well, who's, again, who's making like, solar panels in this country? Uh, quite frankly, I really don't have a list of what the what the companies are, and that's something that I need to look into and maybe at a future college that uh, uh, I don't uh, know exactly the names of the manufacturers or, um, or, or or how much they're doing. To be honest with you, that's something I need to look. And I don't mean it as ignorance. If I say I'll look into it, it is something that I should really look into. Because we're just, we need to see where we can, we can buy American, I agree, we need to buy American. I just don't know which companies are out there that are doing uh, the, the best solar panels right now. Okay. Questions, questions, questions. Back there. Given all your experience in researching climate change, have you heard, in your opinion, what's the best ideas that you've heard from people about a strategy to deal with uh, the issue. Okay, this gentleman here asked me if, if I if I was familiar with Drawdown, which Go. is edited by uh, hold up the book by Paul Hockett. Can you hold up the book now? To answer the question, I have seen the book. I have not read the book, but I have looked through it, and I have taken some excerpts from the book. In fact, it happens to be the ex some excerpts about nuclear power, which is a non-solution. We should not be going in that direction. Paul Hawken refers to nuclear power as a regret solution. Mm -hmm. Now, he calls a lot of this, most of the things in that book, no regrets. And this was borrowed from Dr. John P. Holdren, who we've talked about before at the college a couple years ago, who was Obama's chief science and technology advisor. No regrets refers to solutions that we would want to pursue anyway, even if we didn't have a climate problem, because of the indirect and direct economic and social and the societal benefits from them. So nuclear is off, it may, as far as it should be eliminated, some of course will disagree, and I'm sure we'll get into that in the rebuttal session. Right. Uh, the, the, the book is very good, and I, in fact, well, I might use it as a basis for a future presentation here at the college. Uh, the gentleman asked me if I had, see, had, had was familiar with it, and I haven't read it completely. I haven't gone through it. Now, in terms of uh, solutions, uh, last year in the debate with, with uh, Tim, mm -hmm. I mentioned a combination of two things for energy <coughs> policy, carbon-free, nuclear-free, and solutions project. Carbon-free, <coughs> nuclear-free come from physicist and engineer Dr. Arjun Makajani, who's the um, director of the Energy and Environmental uh, Policy Environmental and Energy Policy Institute, Research Institute, out in Tacoma, uh, uh, Maryland. And the carbon-free, nuclear-free puts us on a pathway of going uh, nu without nukes, replacing nuclear, all oil, coal, and everything. Uh, solutions Project is from uh, Dr. He's an engineer at uh, Stanford University, a uh, civil and uh, environmental engineer. And he, and he says that we can go uh, wind, water, and solar. And so combining these two things, that uh, is Mark, Mark Z, Dr. Mark Z. Jacobson. I just wanted to get the name out. Mark Z. Jacobson and his colleagues have concluded a combination of the two that we can uh, you know, drastically reduce our emissions and get off of all of fossil fuels by, let's say, 2040, 2050. They say it's technically and economically feasible, um, but we have to have the political will to do that. A lot of the stuff with agriculture, um, regenerative uh, agroecological systems, uh, no-till farming, uh, carbon sequestration in the soil, these are all also things that we should be doing. Um, uh, Grass-fed cattle, among other things. Uh, with rotational grazing, that's another option if you're a bee feeder. I'm um, just throwing out some of the solutions. There's recharging water, there's recharging underground aquifers and uh, restoring watersheds with the current water resources we have. Um, so, I mean, I, we can go into some more greater detail, but it's it covers some of the issues regarding like water and agriculture and energy. Can I follow up? Sure, can. Um, the one thing missing out of your question is the political. <laughs> uh, we're trying all, all the all the technical solutions seem feasible. 
but the thing seem, that seems to be really the wrench in the works is all the money behind uh, the fossil fuel industry and then the, the far right wing conspiracy <coughs> theorist conservatives. <coughs> Have you heard anything with, you know, in all your studying on some ideas, <coughs> ideas to deal with that? Well, again, you had the you Citizens United U.S. support uh, decision, which of course allows a limited amounts of soft money in uh, campaigns, and we, we actually we need a constitutional amendment to overturn that. That's easier said than done. Again, you're talking about the, the Koch brothers putting millions of dollars into the primaries and that sort of thing. Uh, in terms of the, there's a lot of good stuff that's going on. Uh, the, the Trump and the Republican <coughs> thing have really have galvanized a lot of the local activism, and people are looking for local solutions. But I agree with you that more needs to be done. Um, the Republic, the Democratic Party really needs to get with it and come up with a good, solid, progressive program is what I've outlined. But of course, that's easier said than done. <coughs> and so I don't know if I'm answering your question completely or not, but at least we're, this is a chance to discuss and to point in the right direction. You said but there are people that are out there doing things on the local level, and that's a good thing. We really need to be a part of this uh, Paris Climate Agreement. We need to be leading the charge on this. Did we I, are running out of time. Did I hear you correctly? You said the Republicans need to do a, 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 a progressive agenda, or is that just a slip in what? saying Republican instead of Democrat, or Democrat instead of Republican? Well, <laughs> well, it actually is both. I mean, the Democratic Party needs to get its act together, but unfortunately, any kind of moderate Republicans have become an endangered species. Get it? Yeah. Because of all the, uh, the, the Koch brothers' money in primary. So it's unfortunate that that's a situation. So that there, if there's any gutsy independent Republicans out there that support such an agenda, that uh, just kind of maybe getting ahead of myself here trying to answer the question, that um, any gutsy independent Republicans also need to, to jump on board. And also the, the Democrats from the coal producing states, they're. Uh, no. I mean, they're, 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 they're going to be an impediment in the opposite direction, though. Yes, Charlie? Yeah, you, uh, I've been in Appalachia for about 10 years. I was going to tell all my friends, you know, don't worry about the mines shutting down because you can get all these green economy jobs, right? <laughs> but on my way over here today, I rode, took me two hours to get here across the city. And I didn't see one solar installation. I didn't see one windmill. So where are the green jobs? It sounds like the only green jobs one can get are writing them books you keep buying. <laughs> well, Charlie, uh, National, the Environmental Law and Policy Center has pointed out that you have, we have major manufacturers for wind turbines and wind, tur wind turbine equipment here in uh, Illinois and Chicago I area in particular. One. Charlie, just Charlie, you just let. let. <laughs> well, you go on for your answers. Yeah, there's I do, I do, one, I do. I do. Because no I want my, I want my, I want my answers. My because because, because I want my answers to be thorough, and I'm one of the few people here that actually has thoroughly researched this stuff. No offense, that I can get up and discuss this stuff and give me a chance to. This is actually my maybe maybe my one time to talk other than just rebuttals, where three minutes, you're done. Four minutes, you're done. This is my opportunity well, to pontificate a little. Well, let's get back. Okay, well, we need the policies and programs to get things going again. Come to Evanston. That, You'll uh, see him. Uh, <laughs> solar is growing. It's, uh, it's the fa it's actually the fastest work. growing renewable energy source right now. And so uh, we need the state alter We need the state programs to get things going. And again, again, uh, major manufacturers for wind turbines and wind turbine equipment are here in uh, in Illinois. In terms of uh, the coal mining jobs, I mentioned the Just and Fair Energy Transition that includes retraining workers. I mentioned this December 17, 2016, when I spoke about redefining progress in terms of what I said. Uh, about the uh, opposing the Exelon nuclear bailout. That was one of the proposals that NEIS has, has set forward. Has gotten some favorable response in Springfield. So, I mean, that the stats are there. I know it may seem, as a, this is how I've encountered this ever since the 70s, that you're looking at the stats, see? I'm looking at the stats. You just can't judge by just, uh, 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 it's, it's a perception issue. 
what you're dealing with is this directly answers your question. It's a perception issue. You go up and down the street, see no solar panels or where are the solar. But yet, overall, renewables are providing more electricity than nuclear nationwide since March of last year. So something's happening, and solar has been growing in the state. We just need, we just need to do more of it, but it's largely a perception issue. As far as wind turbines, there are some horizontal wind turbines that I've seen that could be placed on buildings. I attended a workshop a long time ago at the Center for Green Technology about this. But I've been at, to the Medota Hills Wind Farm in Lee County out west, walked underneath the wind turbines. There are people that farm that land and get double income from their crops and from uh, uh, the electricity that uh, the turbines generate. Dennis, over on the, in the west loop, the presidential towers, there's there's tons of wind turbines up there. I know you don't go working on a roof, but I'm telling you, there's solar panels. I work on the 35th like floor, the and my, my office looks over the city, and I've yet to see a wind turbine from my, my window looking north. Do you know where the if presidential I saw towers one someplace in the whole panorama of the loop, maybe there is one, but not from my window on the 35th floor, overlooking you don't know what you're about 500 buildings. buildings. <laughs> yes, yeah, you drive around the country, you'll see a lot of wind turbines. It's yes, growing, it's a growing yes, area. Yes, yes. They're all right. around oh, west, everywhere, a lot of places. So you have so nothing. Yeah. No, it's no growing. You've got to remember there's a difference between the like a wind farm, like on an agricultural farm or a ranch land and, and putting them here in the city. It's a completely different, I want people to understand, what, he, what they're talking about are two completely different wind turbine designs. You have this, uh, I heard the professor who came up with it, and it's a horizontal wind turbine that can go like on like on a roof and the side of a building and stuff like that. And that's different than the, than the large, you know, like the, the wind turbines that you're seeing on wind farms where you're talking about two completely different designs. Uh, yes? What do you think of these uh, refugees uh, tent slums that are developing in California and across the United States and across Europe because of the liberal, a progressive ideological claptrap that you that you people believe in. You you want to bring these people in? You're you're impoverishing our country, right? You're talking about the immigration issue. Um, Refugees. They're they're making our cities into slums in Europe and the United States. I, I see it. They've got tents over here on the Congress. On the, Especially. They're homeless people. Those, these are homeless people or, or uh, um, people that are in transition to need help. That, that's not due to any policies that I have. These are people that may are down on their luck, that may have lost a job, or because of illness and everything, find themselves homeless in their programs. That doesn't have anything to do with directly to do with the next topic. It doesn't have anything to do with the Where are they? They're in these tents. The homeless <laughs> issue is, is not, has nothing to do with it. It's like got big you know? Yes, it does. They're, 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 so. they're messing up the climate. The, uh, the climate, too. Oh. They're missing the environment. They're guilty of everything. In, 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 in uh, California, they have waste all over here. They got uh, hypodermic leaves over here. They got the tents over there. That's not uh, uh, climate or uh, environment? No, it's not. And I have a friend who happens to be a resident at Pacific Garden Mission, PGM. I've had an opportunity to visit him, and I know pretty much how the thing operates. And I'm just saying that there's a lot of stuff that uh, homeless people need to do for themselves. I'm not putting that off, that you have to uh, take some individual initiative to do something to improve your life. But it's not because of my soul calling. And I said, don't get into uh, you're getting into, again, ideological, liberal, I said, let's leave that out the window, because that, that doesn't have anything. There are some homeless, I agree, but a lot of these people are, are from uh, Mexico coming over here. Hey, Mexico. Oh, hey, 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 those fuckers. <laughs> okay, poverty, poverty is just as much an environmental issue as only consumption and affluence, and that's something that you have to deal with, with the... Uh, with, uh, but, the, but the all over California, with, they're agreeing with me. All these cities in California, 20 of them, they agree with me. <laughs> Keep these people out of here. We're not, uh, this, let's move on. Let's don't get into okay. all this. All this. Yeah, you're into the, this is Earth Day, and that's not really an Earth I consider that to be an Earth Day topic. I've addressed the issue. I've okay. addressed the issue okay. in the context of my experience. And so, uh, yes, the gentleman in the back. Yeah, yeah Dennis, uh, uh, there's been... Um, 
um, considerable to do about uh, April in our latitude here being so cold. Do you have any explanation uh, scientifically about the weather patterns uh, uh, to explain that? Why is it so cold today? And weather is from day to day, week from week, climate is over 30 uh, year period. Again, the average surface temperature of the Earth continues to increase, and that's overall. Now, in terms of specifically what the meteorologists say as to why April is one of, if not the coldest April on record, I haven't looked at what the meteorologists say. That's a good question, though. Maybe there, there maybe Tom, Tom Skilling has addressed that. On, and his weather forecast, and also uh, Cheryl Scott's another excellent meteorologist. Maybe they've talked about that, and, and I've missed it because I haven't been watching their particular broadcast, but that's something also to, to consider. But there's that. I want to make sure there's a difference between climate and energy, but I mean climate and, and uh, weather, but I'm just saying that I don't know specifically what the meteorologists are saying, what the if it's some uh, jet stream or, or whatever factors are involved, I really don't know right now. Uh, yeah, somebody hasn't asked to answer that yeah, you question. Durban, yeah. uh, you wrote to Durban and Duckworth and Tchaikovsky. Yes. What kind of, you, you know, you told us what you said, which was brilliant, but what response did you get from those three? To basically support the position. Jan Sikowski, in fact, I met personally, there was a lunch in the Law and Environmental Policy Center had that um, that I met and her and introduced myself to her, and she's good at, uh, has an automatic message system that at least responds. So um, Durbin also responds, too. I mean, I haven't talked with uh, them on a day-to-day -day basis. I haven't met Tammy Duckworth yet, but... As far as I know, the, the the response is the response is good on things like that. I send out a lot, do a lot of action alerts, see, and I get responses from some of them, and so that they thank me for their my opinions and then state their position. But they're 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 pretty much in, in agreement with uh, the things right. like about negotiation of NAFTA and, and other things that. Um, that I've been sending them. Okay, Dennis, it's Thank getting you. to be about 747. Would you mind um, letting us get the rebuttal started at this yeah, point? Yeah, let's do the rebuttals. And would you mind going ahead and uh, transitioning us into the rebuttal period? I'm looking forward to rebuttals, and I'd just like to have a chance to respond, so let the rebuttals begin. Okay, okay. how many are, how many are going to be? And I'm going to be standing, I'm going to sit right here. Okay. And some people haven't had even one question. When they will now. It's time for rebuttals, it's, Charlie. Yeah, I hate to say, but. We, uh, uh, okay. All right, let's just go. What do you think? About four minutes each? Yeah. Five. I'll go about four minutes each okay, then. Mine's not working. It's not working. No. What's, uh, <laughs> I don't think it's appropriate right What's now. really important <laughs> here? Call me a little bit, okay? Well, the, uh, are we going to do Yeah. Yes, All we are. Right, let's thank our the duty. Let's, okay. let's thank the our no. The duty of the American government is to protect the ruling classes in the United States. And one of the things that preserves the ruling classes is empire. For instance, if you go down to South America, like Chile, you'll find a lot of our grapes and other fruits in the winter time comes from all the way in South America. And how do we get there? And how do we come back? We have to use fossil fuels. It's either by truck or by train or by airplane and things of that nature. In order to grow the food that we eat that's, that never used to be there when I was a kid. That's all they used to have in the winter time was apples and pears and maybe a few other fruits. So we could go back to that time and grow the fruit here and you won't all use up all that fossil fuel. Another thing, 
The United States has approximately 800 bases throughout the world. In order to maintain those bases, they need ships, planes, trains, and so forth that are always in the sky or trucks moving or trains moving on the ground that takes fossil fuels. And we use up a tremendous amount of fossil fuels because of empire. It's because if you grow things in South America or Central America, the profit margin is real high and what they call super profits. And that's what they're after, super profits. They're not really interested in the American people, because if they were, you'd have all kinds of services like they have in some of the European countries, the social democratic European countries, like Sweden, Norway, maybe Finland, and places that have nature. So they're not really interested in the American people, except when the American people put up a, a great big fuss over what is happening. And that's one of the reasons we got out of the uh, Vietnam War, is because of that. And if we look at the difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, under the Democrats, at least to a certain point, if you put pressure on them, they would make some changes in the proper direction, like we had under FDR or Lyndon Johnson. But the Republicans have morphed into an outright fascist party, and they're not interested at all in the American people. So what we need, of course, it's not a duopoly like we have now because the corporations and the bankers, what they do is support both parties. The only difference is they give more money to the Republican Party than they do with, to the Democrats. So we need organizations that will put pressure just to get reforms like they have in the Scandinavian countries. This is a time of transition, and this book, which was written about a year ago, it, it wasn't written by Paul, it was edited by Paul Hawking. They were, these are scientists, uh, basically they started this back in 2000, because it's been going on for a long time. It's a very big research project. Uh, there's, uh, they say, oh well, well, we have electric cars, that'll take care of it. No. There's a hundred different things that go into this that will make the difference. You know what one of the big ones is? Educating girls. Educating girls? Read the book. Um, I don't know if you, many of you, if you know, if you get outside the city or not, uh, you know, there's been a few windmills here and there. And, you know, Indiana didn't have anything uh, a few years ago. <clears throat> Indiana now has the largest wind farm in the Midwest. Uh, on Route 65, just north of Purdue. Well, what is that? British Petroleum. Oh, it's called BP Wind. They've got so much. They've got so much money. They don't have to do it. It's the largest wind farm in the Midwest. <laughs> so things are changing. Uh, and all I can say, I went to a, a, a class just before this. Uh, New York City is disinvesting in fossil fuels. So you're just beginning to see the beginnings of changes are happening. They're happening all over the place. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, we didn't have any solar panels. They didn't, it didn't uh, except for solar, if you wanted to heat your hot water or something. The solar panels are, are going to come in all over the place now. Why? Because they're, they're cheaper than coal. It's cheap, regardless of what Mr. Trump does, it's going to happen anyway. It's like right now, well, spring isn't here, and there aren't any flowers, but all this is going to change in the next month. The flowers will be out. The energy thing is a much longer process, much longer process. But I'd say 
You know, it took about several hundred million years to create fossil fuel. We're going to dig them up in 200, and that's going to change something? Yeah, it is, but it's, it's not good stuff. By the way, are, are, are this year still pretty cold? Go up to Fairbanks, Alaska. It's warmer up there. It's warmer up in Fairbanks. Okay, read the book. Draw it down. Go ahead. With regard to what was said about, well, I don't see any windmills. I see them all the time. And they're in the suburbs, and you travel, as they said, across Indiana, or you travel across downstate, and the windmills are all over the place. Uh, that's number one. And you also see other other buildings like the Latin School of Chicago and Lincoln Park, which have with those little vertical windmills up on top of the building. And as Carl said, anybody who works on a roof sees the sees the solar solar panels all the time. Uh, with regard to the comments that were made by the Trumpist in chief before he left um, about. Uh, the banning of immigrants and tent cities and all the rest of this stuff. <laughs> well, he sounds like the kind of people who back in the 1930s did their best to keep the Jews and other foreigners who were fleeing Hitler uh, from getting into this country. That's number one. Number two, he said, well, other California cities are trying to ban these people. Well, that's not exactly new. California tried to do that in the 1930s when they tried to keep the Okies from coming to California. And in fact, it became an issue in the 1934 gubernatorial campaign there, which the Republicans won for precisely that reason, because they alleged that Upton Sinclair, the Democratic candidate, would just open the door and let all the Okies come rushing in there. Well, I will be dominated by all these southern accented uh, poor people. What can I tell you? Some time ago, Somebody said, as a friend of mine said to me, well, I didn't vote for Hillary because I thought she was a witch. What I should have said to him, what I should have said to him was, I don't agree. But let's for the sake of argument say that she is a witch. Well, I consider Donald Trump to be the human equivalent of a bed bug. <laughs> Given the choice between a witch and a bed bug, which is the one you think I decided to go with? <laughs> <laughs> you see, but witches still have to plan. They have to plan their spells accordingly. And they have to come up with ingredients and uh, different ways to get their brews running and, and the whole bit. Yeah, but if you close your windows at night, they couldn't there come in, go. see? Yes. <laughs> But you see, the thing is, so maybe the bed bug is, the witch is better than the bed bug. <laughs> but I do know that we got Mr. Trump as a president, and I think for finally after maybe a year and a half, he may be starting to become acting a little more like a president. Uh -huh. I'm just uh -huh. saying, he's, uh, if you looked at his, uh, Twitter feed, he's got, I heard a program on Sandra Gare and Fresh Air about he has a guy who helps him write all his tweets. Oh, really? And uh, he's got a guy that's made right next to him, right off the Oval Office, that corrects him for grammatical errors. And uh, he had another chief of staff who was really good at comebacks, so he could get the insults in. And the reason he's doing it is to generate attention to himself. and his staff in uh, the United States, just like P.T. Barnum did with his circus. So he is somewhat of an easy guy to understand if you look at the biography of P.T. Barnum. And to be honest with you, Dave, uh, Dennis, I liked a lot of what you're doing with driving the data for climate change and everything else. Because, you know, I've been familiar with a lot of these issues since about the 1970s. As a matter of fact, you know, one of my first uh, mail order purchases was for the Savonius Rotor by a guy by the name of Gary Brick, and it was a vertical wind farm 
plans, and I went to make one. And, you know, over time I realized that uh, this stuff's good, it's intermittent, but there's certainly not going to be enough power to really replace fossil fuels. Because a lot of times the wind and solar is highly dispersed. It's not concentrated. And, you know, I think what we really need to do is get a really good form of concentrated power. And I know that the present day nuclear power is very questionable. And when you think about it, you think about this and that. And the first thing that comes to mind is an atomic explosion and all this stuff. But when I think about it, and I started looking at the first inklings around maybe 2010, 2011 of the thorium based molten salt reactor, I too found that the claims were somewhat preposterous. But preposterous enough that I started looking into it more and deeper. Preposterous enough that I and had my interest been tweaked. I don't take time off work to go to conferences, but I did with this five times so far. So I've met the experts. I've talked a lot about uh, climate change. I played the role of Charlie there by challenging them. I actually had uh, one guy kind of saying, what are you, some kind of climate nut? He says, no, I just wanted to see what, what you would uh, do. And he says, you are a believer in thorium then? I says, yes, but you do. I do like to challenge people. This is at a conversation I had at the Thorium Energy Conference 5. My point is, I've taken a look at the evidence. The narrative and the data seem well. But it took me having to open up my own mind and look at it and see what happened with it. I'm not going to change your guys' mind by quoting a lot of facts, figures, and whatever. But, you know, there is a lot of stuff out there. I encourage any of you to look at Gordon McDowell and see what he has to say about it. There's a ton of experts on, on this stuff. Chances are I probably met them and talked to them at one point. And I'm now convinced that uh, the newer forms of nuclear power are going to be a very big additive to our climate change. The one thing I will say is this. If you're not pro-nuclear and, and at least willing to look at it, you're not an environmentalist. <coughs> You open up your mind, right? Yes, I did. Show us the surgery because this is the only way that you can open your mind. They have to take the lead off. <laughs> yeah, in, in reference to the uh, previous speaker, uh, Trump is becoming more presidential. He's becoming more like President Putin. <laughs> As you all know, they, they have musical offices in Russia, and uh, Putin was president for a while. He switches with Medvedev, his buddy, uh, as to who actually has the president or prime minister equivalent office. Anyhow, um, yeah, Dennis, thank you for the presentation. I learned a lot, um, and um, um, as, as you all know, I, I worked on the Barry Commodore campaign. I'm glad to hear that he was one of your uh, favorite authors uh, over the years. Uh, uh, so I'm an environmentalist, always have been also uh, from the earliest days, and uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, knowing about these things. I didn't want to put you on the spot about the uh, fact that our April has been cold uh, in this uh, zone. Uh, obviously Alaska and the Arctic are warmer than normal, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, Australia is probably baking in the sun right now. Uh, so I just wondered if you had uh, a handy uh, comeback to those people that bring that up as being a uh, as naysayers. So, and I assume it's probably some kind of combination of the jet stream or polar vortex or one of these other phenomena that meteorologists uh, uh, talk about. Uh, doomsday clock being two minutes from midnight, that's a, a terrible, terrible thing that we're dealing with, uh, stopping Trump from the nuclear war. Uh, I was down there for the uh, activist uh, anti-war uh, um, uh, rally in March. Uh, didn't see too many of you there. Um, everybody's got to get on board with um, showing up for these things. Not everything, but everybody's got to do what they can. Uh, Trump is, uh, uh, yes, if we have any kind of a nuclear uh, disaster where a bunch of nukes go off, um, we are going to be, uh, you know, Carl Sagan, uh, bless him, um, he uh, is one of those that investigated this uh, possibility of a nuclear winter. and. Um, 
uh, he was one of the ones that promoted that that is a danger to humanity. We all we all know that if there's a uh, bunch of nuclear weapons go off, they will uh, uh, do put up a bunch of um, soot, a bunch of uh, uh, particulates in the atmosphere that uh, will be very dangerous um, to humanity. Um, called the nuclear winter uh, scenario. Um, we need to. Um, uh, do all of these good things and oppose the bad things that um, the Trump administration is doing. And um, one of the things I wanted to ask Dennis, uh, um, if he thought there was going to be any uh, silver lining if uh, Trump does uh, get impeached and removed or if he uh, does resign as part of a deal with Mueller and we end up with Pence. Will Pence be worse for, even worse for the environment? It's something to consider, uh, but the danger to humanity is, of course, uh, uh, the, the worst thing we have to worry about. And, um, um, yeah, that's mostly what I wanted to say, and um, um, I'm uh, looking forward to um, the resistance uh, getting better, and uh, possibly we uh, at least uh, uh, recently heard that uh, at least the NASA funding for uh, studying the Arctic uh, Oh, I wanted to mention the methane. I don't think that was really emphasized in the talk tonight. That's one thing. No, it wasn't. Where the uh, permafrost, uh, the danger, uh, the methane uh, uh, chlorides, or, or whatever they call them, chlorides. Um, it's a methane, methane uh, complex uh, compound that uh, uh, as the oceans warm, it releases methane from the deep ocean, and that's a great danger. Methane is a worse um, climate, uh, a worse uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, than carbon dioxide. And um, we are experiencing a lot of uh, uh, methane uh, coming from the permafrost. And uh, and actually, that's a structurally, it's terrible for Alaska. You know, it's kind of crazy to Sarah Palin that they elected that goofy governor, and she ran for vice president and came within a whisker of being a one heartbeat from the presidency. It's just incredible ignorant people we have to educate people um, uh, we have sincere dangers to our to our uh, globe and um, and um, our, our human species and other species as has been pointed out so uh, everybody get on board yeah. don't really have a rebuttal I really like the, the talk um, Flint Michigan is uh, talking about the Clean Water Act. People can't even get clean water and then they're forced to uh, to buy it. And now Flynn is discussing trying to privatize the water system. What a nightmare. The big problem is all the money to replace all the pipes in Flint, Michigan. They can't do it. They, they don't have the money. Um, a little closer to home. Who else has a similar problem? Chicago. Up until 1982, the building department, the city of Chicago required contractors when they were tapping the, the city water system to use lead pipe. Uh, uh, <laughs> and now what the city does is they test the water, the minimum amount of testing, but what they do is they found out that they're basically testing the homes of selected employees of the water department where they know the tests are going to pass with flying colors and they're going their newspapers testing homes and finding out that that these uh, homeowners especially on the south side are having really high levels of, of, uh, of lead in their water it's, uh, it's just terrible and millions of dollars millions of dollars to replace all those lead pipes now now, this is basic, this is one part of infrastructure. I mean, if you try to think about all the different infrastructure in the city, um, we have a tremendous amount of money and we got bridges falling apart and sidewalks and streets. And I, I'm getting to uh, uh, climate change. Uh, a huge percentage of the Earth's population are in metropolitan areas that are on the coast. And if you look over a period of 30, 40 years, and with uh, the, um, the coastline basically invading cities, you're going to see huge displacements of population. I mean, close to a billion people displaced. 
And it's not just, I don't know if people really think about this. I mean, you're asking, it's like a, a war where people flee the city and then where do they go? They set up a camp and they live in tents. But this isn't going to be a war. It's going to be the, the earth rebelling against humankind and they're going to be displaced. And it's going to create a nightmare. You're going to open up all these countries with all this chaos. And that's how fascism starts. They take advantage of all these, uh, of this social unrest. It's going to create a huge amount of problem. You know, the, the, an example of uh, somebody who agrees with me, uh, everybody knows the Pentagon isn't a very liberal institution, but they say that the number one threat to national security is climate change. The Pentagon. So uh, I just, I, I'm not sure if people really understand, they can really see what's going to happen in two or three generations. And um, I just wish that somehow we could paint a picture for them so it's not just this theoretical thing. All right, Mr. Charlie. All right. <laughs> All right, let's thank Dennis again for uh, a nice, well-prepared presentation. And uh, for all he's done this year, I'll be eclectic as usual, covering a number of points here. Um, the, uh, I must say here, all I asked was, you know, I, I, the doctor told me, to charge Charlie, you got to walk a lot. And, um, you know, as I walk, I, I don't drive, I don't own a car, you know, so I walk, trying to do some walking around and, you know, I, I happen to notice I published a book for the government on green building technology and I don't see much green. I, I've got about the greenest house uh, without getting into it in the neighborhood. And from you guys, I say, well, where's all the green installations? And according to my pals here, and one guy says, well, go up to Evanston, which is 10 miles away from my house. And the other guy says, go to Indiana. <laughs> well, come on, guys. <laughs> uh, that's not around the corner. That's not evidence of a lot of installation Travel here. Travel runs to my uh, What? Go to Indiana. Oh, travel ten miles up to Evanston, and you'll Just go and you'll find one there. Stone. Now, the other thing is, uh, you're a science man. You march here. You told me you use the word science about um, over um, 50 times there. You march for science. They kind of tell me, sir, what are the scientifically established harmful effects of eating GMO foods? It's kind of a leading question because we had the speaker here and I know the answer to it. But I want to know what the scientifically established specific harmful effects are. What, what would happen to me by eating GMO food? The other thing, and this is kind of like a, a, a conservative here, he also talked about the, the um, the doomsday clock, and I, I'll be honest with you, I, this was the conservative who hit me with the figures, but, and I don't have an answer yet myself, but he said, what is scientific about the doomsday clock? So I, maybe you guys can help me up or collectively we can come up with an answer. Now the other thing about the greenies here, they're, oh, the sky is falling, right? And, you know, listen to this, I was thinking about this, when I started coming to the college, one of the very first speakers I had scheduled decades ago was a guy, and you mentioned this, who talked about overpopulation. <laughs> <laughs> How long ago was that? <laughs> and he had all these dire consequences. The world was coming to an end. I remember we even scheduled it again twice. <laughs> but I'm still waiting for that. Um, the, another thing is, um, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the one thing about the, the green, green jobs and the green economy though, and I'm serious about this, you, you mentioned that your dad worked for the Union Pacific, and about green technology replacing fossil fuels. 
people don't realize that there's only one place in the United States where they have a four-track main. That means two tracks in one direction and two tracks the other way. And that's from the coal fields in Wyoming, the Powder River Basin. Mm -hmm. And they're shipping coal 24 hours a day. And the railroads didn't put that much trackage in unless they got a reason to do it. It's enormously expensive. And when I say that a four-track main, that's the only one that I'm aware of in the United States. There's a three-tracker right here in Chicago that's relatively famous and well-known. The people come from around the United States to take a look at it. But a four-track is exists in only one place. Now, do we have that much green technology that's replacing that much coal? Now, granted, they're going down to natural gas and there's other variables. But that's replacing an awful lot of energy. And I don't know if we've got that quite much infrastructure. When I left the topic, the cost of even like water heater and things like that didn't merit the, you got all excited, you're oh yeah, get lost, Charlie. But the cost was not, there's go value engineering, it's the cost of the installation, what is the payback time? I put insulation in my house, I'm probably never going to get the payback for money costs. I'll be quite candid with you, but I went ahead and did it anyway. Because I got, I got stucco and the layers of insulation. The only house around, and I assure you, you can't find one on that. So yeah, but the payback, I doubt if I'll ever get it back. But I wanted to have to go ahead and do that. Now the last thing I got asked about, and I haven't read the book, but I did work for you, you know, all through high school. I worked at the produce market, uh, Water Market Street down on the south side where we got produce for all the grocery stores and restaurants. And I don't really understand this concept here about eating locally grown food. <laughs> that just doesn't, I mean, food is grown in specific locations, such as like Illinois grows a lot of pumpkins because the companies that can pumpkin buy stuff are in Illinois. And there's other reasons, but Farms aren't like old McDonald farms, like eat locally. I go to farmer's market and I go, that's not stuff grown locally. Don't, <laughs> don't, there may be one vendor or somebody, but that's not how agriculture works. Potatoes are grown here and peanuts down there and Georgia. Uh, citrus is in Florida. Florida. I, that's, it's transported by truck, it's not how it works, so I don't know what direction there is in, in doing that kind of thing, uh, it, it, that, but I'll have to read the book, I'll take a look for it. Uh, anyhow, but anyhow, thank you very much, we got a lot to talk about here. Thank you again, we'll see you next Earth Day then. All right, save the Earth. All right, we've got a couple of others. Your friend of the earth, right? Yes. <laughs> Even the earth is burning thorium in its core, Charlie. Yeah, it's the decay of that thorium that keeps Whoa, our planet in the, the magnetic yeah, field. Yeah, good. Yeah. All right. We'll turn it off. Yeah. Yeah. That's just a follow-up question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, about the methane gas or over the, the migration of people. I think we need to do on kind a of global scale. That really, uh, per, per, look, look for new locations for cities. We have to live in cities. We have to better live in cities. Uh, people are migrating constantly over the world from our, our farms or rural areas into the, into the urban areas. And like this continuous process. 1995, I think, was the year that the world tilted over more urban people than rural, rural people. So this is, this is going to go on and on. The thing is, we should try and really look for new locations for cities. You talk about the global problem or the Flint, Michigan problem, old, older areas. Try and find locations. You've got to zone these off now. This is the problem. And uh, stay away from volcanic and earthquake areas of was obvious, and again, flood areas. Leave the lowlands go. I mean, if it's farm areas, let it go. Let it for park districts or whatever you have to go. Don't build on those areas. You gotta zone it off properly. And, and the problem is you gotta prevent those rich and famous from 
going in there and say, I want to buy it lightly. No, you got to stop that. You got to zone them off, put the roads in, especially the, the utilities, the water, especially water. You've got to, we got to go in there so we can recycle water, use it, you know, build the right places. Uh, you talk about methane gas, you get methane gas out of sewers. You can take that, absorb it, and burn it. You can use it. Um, you can put it in your infrastructure, right. like especially roads and railroads, and build around all this now. But, and then, um, what else can you get? Concentrate on um, What's the whole, the whole picture? You understand what the whole picture I'm trying to say is they have to build around this thing, build the infrastructure first. It's the cheapest way probably to do it. And you can put the new technology, new energy, you can put windmills or you can put sun panels all around if you want or something. And it's, uh, but we have to do it at a global scale everywhere because it's just a continuous problem. People coming into cities, moving in, creating a slum area that is overpopulation. They haven't got jobs. They get, and it's going to be a, I think a, a global scale, global scale problem for everybody. Okay. All right. All right. Margaret, how can I get some of that free methane? It works. Just, yeah, eat Just eat some beans, Charlie. Just eat some beans, Charlie. Okay. We got enough hot air here too to get a windmill going. Basically, the uh, when people were talking about this being a cold April, you know the the. the Seasons have always varied and, and have always been kind of cyclical in terms of some some seasons it's cold, some seasons it's warmer. It just depends, and that is what Janice was pointing out as, as the difference between weather and climate change, actual climate change, that which is a much longer uh, term look at things. But in terms of climate change, we are having some significant problems, and we have been having some significant problems for the last 20 years. The droughts in Africa are responsible for the refugees uh, trying to go into Europe because yeah. they live, they're, they're not able to grow um, their crops because they don't have the water. There's political unrest in, in the areas that they live in. They watch, they're watching their children starve to death. They're wa they are seeing um, their neighbors murdered. And so they're fleeing for their lives, literally, and for the lives of their families. And they're drowning in the Mediterranean, crossing on rubber dinghies or, or the, the kinds of the beach balls or whatever they have to cross over the Mediterranean from um, uh, from Northern Africa into Spain, for example, there's a huge refugee problem. Um, the other problem, we've talked about the uh, melting of the permafrost, and what, what's happened is that the areas furthest away from the equator, the, the Arctic and the Antarctic, are much more affected by the warming than other places. So it is warmer there because they're more affected by actual global warming. Mm -hmm. And so what we have is, is indigenous peoples there who can't live anymore in their villages because their permafrost is defrosted. It's been that way for thousands of years. And their houses are collapsing. And, and if they're on the coast, they're collapsing into the water. The US Navy is uh, <coughs> building, is, is planning and trying to build uh, protections for the shipyards where they build the ships that are on the coastline to protect it against rising sea levels. The Navy says there's global warming and it's resulting in rising sea levels. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, our fearless leader is, I don't know, looking up somebody's skirt. So the, uh, the, the book that's very, really important about this is Na Naomi Orestes, and it was mentioned earlier, uh, The Merchants of Doubt. And what she does is she talks about the, the, the similarities between the way the tobacco industry um, did its defense and the current climate deniers are doing their defense. So the tobacco industry funded people to manage this defense because both industries in fact know the tobacco industry knew that tobacco and use of tobacco caused cancer. They knew that from 1930. They knew that. 
And they knew that it would come out eventually, but what they were doing was using delaying tactics. And the people who are the climate deniers know that climate change is real. They know it. And the pe they are using, in fact, the exact same individuals to do their, uh, to delay and deny that ch the, the climate change is a real thing. It, and the two individuals are people who are old time Republicans. I must, they must be almost 90 years old by now. And what they want to do is prevent this communist conspiracy of climate change and tobacco use. So I think that we need to call them for the bullshit that it is. <laughs> And I think that we need to understand that this really is something that we have to understand ourselves and look at the science. And since 98% of people who are actual scientists, who are real scientists from real universities with real scientific degrees, and with degrees in areas like geology and, and, and climate science and um, other areas that are directly related to this say climate change change is real global warming is real and human beings have caused it okay any other oh you get going okay go ahead no he's not going on oh all right well Okay, Dennis, if you want to rebut and then get taken the last word, please gavel us out when you're finished. Okay. Uh, Mr. Nelson, before you say, say it again, Walter and Barbara, what's your last name? King Solver. You know what, I'll write it down for you. Yeah, do you have a piece of paper? You want me to yeah, do it? We'll deal with that after. I'll do it. Okay, I'm going to get the rebuttal so we can get out of here. Thank you very thank much you, for coming. You. Very. Thank you very much for your participation. Um, Animal Vegetable Miracle was a, a one-year experiment. Not everybody is would be it practical to eat locally. You, you've, you've got to focus on the local and also remember regional. They knew the farmers in the area that they went to in southwestern Virginia, and she defines regional within a 100-mile radius. So it gives you a more leeway than just maybe going down the block and everything. I just want to make sure that's clear. We're talking about regional as well as local. And again, um, support your farmer's markets. That took the words right out of my mouth because that's what I would recommend that people can do. Not everybody can do what she did. Not everybody has the capability. I don't have the capability, but I do support the farmer's market that should be coming up in East Rogers Park, right along two blocks of Glenwood every Sunday. Uh, around near the, uh, the, the Morris L stop, they block it off and it's a great farmer's market and they have people coming from Michigan and downstate and things like that. So it's not just you know around the Chicago land, it's, it's a regional thing we're talking about. This is to reduce, of course, the use of fossil fuels. One of the chagrins that their older, older daughter had was that she couldn't have bananas in the winter time. She'd been used to having bananas in the winter time. Of course, it's not seasonal, not local. And so that was one of the things that the family had to give up. And that was one of the, the amusing uh, points that the, that, the, the, that the book raised. Definitely drawdown is something that I do want to get. Um, if I get the money, I'll buy it. it is, it's now at the Barnes & Noble DePaul Center for what it's worth. In fact, that's where I picked up the copy and made some notes from it. And also if the Herald Washington, if a library like the Herald Washington Library Center gets it or elsewhere, I'll be sure to check it out. Uh, empowerment of young women through education, absolutely so. And I mentioned this, in fact, a couple years ago in my first day uh, presentation. Bill McKibben of 350.org, the dis, uh, divestment of, of fossil fuels, the, the divestment, absolutely, being done by universities, governments, and everything. Uh, talking about the, uh, the back in the 1930s, uh, the, the Dust Bowl, the Okies uh, going to California being persecuted. Recommend that you haven't done so, check out a book and a movie called The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. It's about that. It's an excellent movie with uh, Henry Fonda as, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as the leading role. The Trump, Donald Trump is a good leader at doing the wrong things. <laughs> it depends on which, how you define leadership. I think by pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement is the poorest leadership possible. Um, 
we can get into this in another um, session, and this is based upon one of the this is based upon one of this this book, Energy Sprawl Solutions. Scientists from the Nature Conservancy have talked about using more regional comprehensive planning for energy projects rather than a piece by piece, case by case, what happens now, as what happened in uh, the uh, southern uh, Mojave, Mojave uh, eco uh, region where there are solar projects that were proposed and that there are recommendations to protect critical habitat for species like the desert tortoise, uh, things like that. Um, again, a combination of carbon free, nuclear free, whatever can displace fossil fuels. And the book talks about the potentials for both solar and wind. We just need to do better planning on a larger scale, a regional scale, comprehensive scale, rather than just by project by project. Tim, see, though I respect his views, he wants to technically fix nuclear power. This is what you're going to be hearing now. And my view is more comprehensive and deals with also the non-technical problems that nuclear power poses. Uh, and real environmentalists support nuclear free. I'm sorry, Tim, but uh, I have to disagree 100% with you. Real environmentalists support a nuclear free future. Um, something about uh, go back to uh, methane gas. That's uh, feedback mechanisms, uh, releasing the feed, releasing the methane, both from the Arctic permafrost and from the ocean sediment bottom. Um, yeah, explain something about the potency. See, molecule by molecule, methane is 20 to 88 times more effective than carbon dioxide for keeping, trapping heat in the atmosphere, but it's 25% volume. 50% volume, or almost about a half of our greenhouse gases is, is, is carbon dioxide. And again, we should be capturing, as it was mentioned before, we should capture the methane both from landfills and from agricultural operations to, uh, to use that for, for energy. It's the chemical equivalent of natural gas. Uh, one of the things regarding methane I wanted to point out, nobody asked about, was that the um, Trump administration wants to weaken the methane protections to cut down on the emissions of methane from the uh, oil and gas industry. I supported those uh, initial recommendations, and then now Trump wants to weaken them and that, again, action alerts that I've received, you know, to encourage the Trump administration um, not to do so. Charlie talked about opening up the coal fields in Wyoming, the railroads. Actually, my father had a part in that. I loved him dearly, but he was actually one of, if not the person, that went out to open up the uh, coal fields uh, in Wyoming and, uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. In terms of the leasing policies on coal, he thought that James Watt was right. Again, another disagreement that I had with him. Again, we need to get off of coal and go into more renewables and efficiency. But I thought that that was something, since Charlie mentioned about the railroads, uh, my father worked with, it was the Chicago Northwestern Railroad back then, not the UP. What he did was, a lot of these people, they would want the farmers and the ranchers to come in and come into the office for appointments. They don't have time. They're taking care of their business. So my father, he puts on his flannel shirt and blue jeans and boots went out in the pickup truck to get, hey, how you doing? He's a friendly guy. And he got the ranchers and, the, and, and everybody to sign the leases. See, and I'm not saying I agree with the policy, but that's how my father did things. He got out and did that, because we didn't have, to have time to come into an office and, and, and take your time out from the field to do that kind of stuff. Uh, if there's anything here. Uh, unfortunately, if Trump is uh, impeached, and I hope that he is, when, if the Repu when the Republicans, let's be optimistic, take control of the House in the next election, Pence is still going to continue the policies. We can get rid of the bellicose personalities, we can get rid of uh, Scott Pruitt, we got rid of James Watt, and the policies under Reagan still continued by the Secretary of the Interior. Um, um, everybody's got to do their part, as I said before. Everybody you will know, participate in marches, so March for Science, Climate March, uh, go online for petitions, things like that. The both the atomic scientist clock is a policy statement by scientists. Scientists are allowed to do that. The the staff of the bulletin and the scientists that are advising them, their advisory board, those are the ones that make that decision. It's not just a scientific decision, it's a policy decision made by scientists. One more thing is regarding nuclear winter, of course the late Carl Sagan 
Uh, there's a book entitled Science as a Contact Sport by Stephen Schneider, the late Stephen Schneider, the climatologist from Stanford University, who had a public disagreement with Sagan, who referred to it more as nuclear autumn. It's not nuclear winter light, it's not that it's going to be light and lively, but it was just something maybe slightly less serious that kind of ticked Sagan off, and there was kind of a, a public feud about that. So uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. And um, Dennis, before Earth Day, you go, Earth Day, Earth Day weekend. Before you go, somebody's left some keys, and if you got them, I uh, check because uh, there's a phone number on them. Please gavel us out. Okay, for Earth Day, Earth Month. Thank you very much. And this session of the College of Conference is officially over.